All right, we are almost starting. In so we will start in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so uh, welcome to everyone to this uh, annual meeting of the Dynamic Coalition Community Connectivity, DC3, that has, has been working on community connectivity issues for the past uh, seven years and so we are we are now at the seventh uh, re annual report you can find here hard copies or also on the uh, web page of the DC3 they are already available in PDF to for you to download and uh, the theme of this year that we have chosen and some of you have helped as developed in this report is community networks building digital sovereignty and environmental sustainability and the idea uh, behind this is that community networks offer us a very good example of a, uh, an additional conception of digital sovereignty and how also environmental sustainability can be achieved through a community driven effort so not necessarily only through policies and governance system that are defined by states, but also by through uh, policies and governance models that are uh, driven by the communities themselves. And that is a, an important conception uh, in the debate of digital sovereignty. We have been speaking a lot about this over the week. The fact that digital sovereignty is not only about authoritarian regimes controlling, is not only about protectionism, is also very much also about understanding the technology to be able to develop it and regulate it in an effective way. And this is very much what uh, community networks have been doing over the past 20 years in terms of self-determination, in terms of understanding how the technology works, developing it and creating their own governance uh, models, self-governance model to manage the uh, connectivity infrastructure as a commons, right? And this is actually, it's very good also to unleash forces that support environmental sustainability as when you understand the technology, you understand also not only the good benefits of the technology, but also the, neg the potential negative impact in terms of negative externalities, in environmental externalities, and you also try to understand how to develop it in a way that is more green if you want and also you can use you can leverage connectivity at the local level to support initiatives that promote sustainability and this in a nutshell and what we are going to speak uh, today with a lot of very uh, distinguished uh, panelists let me uh, first also uh, thank uh, my colleague Senka Hadzic who has been uh, developing uh, th this work uh, over the past years uh, together, uh, including the, 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 the edition of the reports uh, together with me. Uh, she has been the force behind the organization of the, the, uh, the panel and uh, she will only speak uh, lightly today because she has involved in intense karaoke yesterday evening. So <laughs> uh, let's <laughs> uh, let me also introduce our distinguished panelists starting from uh, Atsuko Okuda that is joining us remotely. She is the directress of the ITU Asia Pacific uh, Bureau. Uh, then we have Hakeo Gatto from CGI.br, uh, the Brazilian Inter uh, Steering Committee. We have Amresh Fukir uh, from ISOC uh, that also is joining us online, uh, together with Pedro Vilchez uh, from Gifinet, also joining us online. And then back here in, 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 in person, we have Carlos Baca, who is from uh, SITSAC, and Nils Brock uh, from Rhizomatica. Uh, without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Atsuko Kuda to provide some introductory remarks to understand also the kind of vision and interest that an organization like ITU may have in this kind of initiative that we are discussing and analyzing here. Uh, Atsuko, can you hear us? Yes. Excellent. And I hope that you can hear me too. Very well, thank you. Great, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizer for inviting ITU to today's session, 
dynamic coalition session on community networks, digital sovereignty, and sustainability. This topic is very close to my heart and is, is also a core area of ITU in Asia and the Pacific that we are undertaking in partnership with communities, UN agencies, governments, civil society, academia, and financial institutions. Let me first start with the connectivity part, where we have good and bad news. According to the latest estimate of ITU, which is released in September this year, 2.6 billion people still remain unconnected globally. It is good news as there is a decrease by 100 million uh, from the previous estimates in 2022. It is bad news because the pace of connecting the unconnected may be decelerating. Under the COVID pandemic, almost 800 million people were estimated to have joined the cyberspace for a short time span between 2019 and 2021. In Asia and the Pacific, more than 96% of the population is covered by 4G uh, mobile networks, according to the ITU statistics. Furthermore, the GSMA, more Global Mobile uh, Suppliers Association, reported that around 265 commercial 5G networks have been launched globally and 62 in Asia and the Pacific. But universal and meaningful connectivity where everyone can enjoy a safe, satisfying, enriching, productive, and affordable online experience remains a challenge in the region. Recognizing the important role that digitization plays in meeting the SDGs, ITU and the Office of the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Technology have established a set of aspirational targets for 2030 across internet connectivity, achieving gender parity, addressing digital skills, broadband speed, and its affordability, which is measured as less than 2% of GNI per capita by 2025. These remain a high priority for governments across the globe, and various policy measures are being put in place to achieve the targets. In order for us to make significant and accelerated progress towards the targets and the SDGs by 2030, we need a qualitative transformation in the way we approach the digital divide and we connect the unconnected. We learned that a siloed approach may not work any longer and strengthened partnership is a must to create synergies and impact. More importantly, we are gaining ground in building consensus on the need for a whole of government and whole of society approach to overcome the silos and build stronger partnerships. ITU Smart Villages and Smart Islands Initiatives is an initiative designed on the whole of government and whole of society approach. It is being rolled out in 15 countries in Asia and the Pacific and is aimed to deliver connectivity, digital skills, and priority digital services to rural and remote communities. It is being delivered in close collaboration with various line ministries, UN agencies, private sector, and civil society and academia. And it has generated tremendous support including that of G20 members during their meeting under Indonesia's presidency in 2022. On the sustainability part, I'm very happy to see our ISOC colleague here in the session as we recently conducted a study jointly. Uh, the report uh, entitled From Telecenters, Community Networks to Sustainable Smart Villages and Smart Islands, which is under finalization. The study identified six dimensions of sustainability, of course, financial, social, cultural, organizational, 
operational policy as well as environmental sustainability based on the good practices and lessons learned from telecenters and community networks and provided suggestions for smart villages and smart islands to look at the uh, while looking at the 10 case studies i'm also very happy to such to see such a distinguished list of speakers today who would be sharing their thoughts on this important aspect. And through our discussions and partnerships, I hope that we can accelerate our efforts to connect the unconnected and ensure that no one is left behind and offline. Thank you, back to you. Thank you very much for the very good uh, overview of all the initiatives and uh, the also the the ambition of ITU of leading this effort also as a hub for various st stakeholders to interact and promote a more sustainable connectivity. Now let's uh, try to uh, narrow down from the global to the local and uh, see what uh, is happening in Brazil. And Raquel has been leading several efforts about this uh, over the past uh, couple of years. So please, Bra Raquel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca, and I'm very happy to join you uh, in, in this meeting. Uh, I see some uh, familiar faces and new faces that I'm glad to interact with. Uh, uh, I had a lot to cover, as usual, <laughs> so I'm trying to keep it short uh, and bring you uh, at, at least three uh, highlights that I, I think are important uh, covering the, uh, the past uh, two, three years uh, since 2020. Uh, when um, uh, more of this movement on community networks landed in Brazil uh, concretely. Uh, so first of all, um, I, I want to start um, uh, talking about uh, CGI's study on um, community networks. So this was um, a study undertaken um, um, as more of a statistical uh, approach. So there are some uh, qualitative interviews, but then uh, the idea was really to bring this evidence-based um, approach to uh, what are the community networks, how they are um, being organized and what are the challenges, the state of art of the community networks in Brazil, and, and really understand those and bring into more uh, uh, of the numbers and indicators that could guide some of the policy making. Um, I, I'm not going through all of this study. I can point you, and, and certainly this has circulated already in the Dynamic Coalition, but uh, I think it's important to, to start with this as an angle where um, the study showed, for example, uh, that some of the gaps that we have in terms of community networks that are not a surprise for <laughs> some of you here, uh, most of the, the community networks, they don't survive the first year, and the other half, they don't know if they're going to survive for another year. So uh, those are kind of the, the, the mapping uh, results that we have in terms of the sustainability of the community networks itself and uh, where we need to, to bring the efforts. Uh, it's not only about the resources in terms of money, of course funding is one of them, but it's also the resourcing in terms of the technical requirements, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, registration requirements and, 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 and how the uh, regulatory environment is also not uh, helpful. Uh, for uh, for the community networks to 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 continue to survive and blossom, so that's one of the the, the key takeaways I want to to, to bring in uh, from this study. And then, of course, um, a major piece, and it was uh, really uh, what um, moved, uh, let's say, Brazil government <laughs> into more uh, the the community networks um, friendly side is. Um, APC has conducted uh, an study uh, together with uh, Anatel and 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 uh, uh, the UK FDCO uh, funding uh, that had uh, this massive uh, work on the poli on on a policy brief. Um, it has a lot of recommendations on how. Well, it also brought all this historical, uh, you know, 
telecommunications overview in Brazil and how it evolved, and then what are the challenges for community networks itself, explaining what the community networks are and where are the gaps uh, in the regulatory space. Uh, but it really landed into these recommendations uh, for Anatel, for the communication ministry, for all those decision makers, uh, what they need to do uh, or that need to be done, right? Uh, uh, not a personal thing, but what needs to be done uh, to uh, help the community networks uh, to to grow, well, to be created and then to grow and and uh, evolve. And so that's uh, um, among the recommendations. So the, the the work that was done was the policy brief, but also a toolkit, a technical toolkit. Uh, to show how uh, community networks could be created and of course based in many of the materials that um, the members of the Dynamic Coalition have already um, circulated. So this would not be a new in terms of content. But it's new that it's landed uh, into the telco uh, regulator uh, website. So Anatel is promoting it also as part of their work. Um, and and uh, this is an important shift in 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 uh, the telco regulator um, uh, approach to to community networks. Uh, and among the recommendations, so I'm not going uh, through all of them. Uh, I, I think there are other valuable uh, recommendations that we can discuss at some point in terms of uh, universal funds and so on. But I want to focus on one that is about the creation of a local um, a committee to interact more um, deep uh, in depth with Anatel uh, and and uh, the, the 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 providers the the service uh, internet service providers group and uh, the community network leaders um, and this recommendation um, has been taken on by uh, by Anatel. And uh, this group was created uh, early this year. Um, it's called the Community Networks Working Group within Anatel. Uh, it had the mandate to August. It was postponed uh, to end of this month, uh, to the end of October. And I just got the, uh, the confirmation this morning that it's going to have an event uh, hosted uh, by Anatel on November 22nd. So for the Brazilians in the room, please <laughs> uh, take in your calendars. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the purpose of this group, so uh, first let me go one way back. <laughs> Uh, when the, the APC's study was being um, uh, done, uh, there was this creation of a local uh, uh, group with experts. So not only the community network leaders itself, but also the organizations that were uh, the intermediaries that then that were uh, fostering the, the community networks um, um, uh, development. And so uh, this, this, this local group uh, provided advice on uh, the materials that were done and submitted, uh, but also it has evolved from uh, 10, 12 uh, people and organizations uh, that were involved to now uh, 40 or 50 uh, that are really, um, and it's a really growing number, uh, and we are calling uh, the, the, the local community networks um, um, group in Brazil. Uh, that held uh, weekly meetings, and uh, and this group has three seats uh, in the in in Anatel's um, um, working group, so the more official working group. And why I'm saying all of that, right? Uh, why is this valuable for uh, for everyone listening? Is the importance of keeping first uh, this uh, connection with the local actors uh, to keep it. Um, lightweight at some point, but also to keep it uh, uh, ongoing and to have kind of this major um, goal and common goal, right? Uh, to have everybody uh, on board uh, with the same uh, outcome and in, 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 in vision. Uh, and this was really important uh, to, to bring us um, more strongly and and to show that somehow we are uh, organized within and to interact uh, within uh, the, the the government actors um, and uh, th this is part of the change that is ongoing uh, right now in Brazil of course um, there are still a lot of challenges I mean even within and now talking about the the, the working group uh, uh, from Anatel working group um, 
the interaction with the other actors and how still community networks can be misunderstood is there. Uh, this is a risk, right? I, it's not um, a, a local ISP uh, 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 for, for remote areas. So the understanding that community networks is um, uh, community-based and, and, and it's not about the service itself, I know, one minute, uh, <laughs> is still a challenge. Uh, but it's being broken down into these smaller opportunities uh, to showcase. So uh, the, the event and the continuous network uh, with the local decision makers is, is, is important. And uh, lastly, because I only have one minute or 30 seconds, according to Luca here, uh, uh, I just want to, to, to say that uh, also in Brazil, we have an opportunity for 2024 uh, with the G20, and, and I think ITU was mentioning that. Uh, so Brazil is the host for G20, and it has already announced its agenda with a pretty heavy digital pillar, including universal and meaningful connectivity. So that's going to be, again, uh, an opportunity uh, to be taking on uh, and, and to, to strengthen all these uh, opportunities um, and, and, and tackle, right, uh, not only the policy changes that needs to be done, but also the funding and the resources that need to be uh, put in place for community networks. So thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. Um, we'll make sure to circulate these uh, materials in the mailing list, like both the uh, CGI study as well as the um, APC policy brief. Um, now I'm introducing our next speaker who is joining us um, online from Mauritius. Um, Mauritius Fouquier is um, an internet, internet measurement and data expert at the Internet Society, and he will tell us um, um, about ISOC's work on community networks and also give us an overview on the link between uh, community networks and, and environmental sustainability. Welcome, Amrish. Thank you, Sanka. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today in your, in your panel. Uh, uh, as Sanka mentioned, uh, I work at the Internet Society, uh, not so much involved in the community networks, but I, I can talk about uh, the aspects, some of the aspects such as uh, digital sovereignty or even sustainability that touches upon uh, um, how, how, how it impacts uh, positively uh, community networks, basically. Um, so first of all, um, I would like to um, uh, remind the, um, the audience of the vision of the Internet Society, which is about uh, how the internet is 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 for everyone and how we are working towards making this vision uh, a reality and uh, one of the projects that we uh, are uh, really involved in is uh, expanding community networks around the world and um, we hope that by 2025 we will uh, support uh, more than a hundred complementary connectivity solutions and also be able to train more than 10,000 people to, to maintain their own uh, internet infrastructure. Uh, in the Internet Society itself has supported uh, a, a couple of uh, community networks around the world, um, from, from Africa to Asia. Uh, one recent intervention was the deployment of community networks in, in the Himalayas, in, ne in Nepal. And uh, the issue of digital sovereignty and uh, um, environmental um, sustainability is, is key. Uh, first of all, uh, there, are, there are, as you know, there are many places where uh, access to electricity, uh, especially in, in some African countries, is still an issue. Not only the, the issue is affordability, uh, but even the stability of the network is a problem, as you as Sanka can witness uh, about uh, how, how bad electricity supply is in South Africa for the moment. So having access to uh, renewable energy sources is important and at the same time bringing down the costs uh, of access to uh, equipment that would al allow community networks to uh, operate uh, without being on the, on the grid. Um, Another point I wanted to touch upon is also uh, access to, to content. Uh, as we know, uh, even if you are a community network, um, your 
customers, your constituents uh, still need, they still have the same uh, needs as any other internet user. So they would still want to um, watch the latest uh, news or the latest uh, YouTube video. And uh, we, we work as hard as we can to uh, connect community networks to the mainstream uh, internet. And uh, uh, we, at the Internet Society, we also try to promote the, the connectivity to, to local infrastructure, such as internet exchange points. So uh, usually what we found is that uh, a community network will rely on um, a, an internet provider, internet service provider. And uh, as much as possible, we, we tend to promote internet service providers that are themselves connected to the local fabric, the local ecosystem. The more internet service providers is connected to the to an internet exchange point, it means that local traffic is going to stay local as as much as possible, and as much uh, as as this local fabric is um, you know maturing, uh, there is also uh, a higher chance for um, you know content providers to to host themselves locally because the the customer base is is also increasing. And this is what I would call collateral benefit to the community networks. Even if they are in remote places, they are still connected to the same uh, uh, local fabric. And eventually, they would also benefit from having local connectivity. And having local connectivity means that uh, it is adding up to the equation of env environmental sustainability. Because of course, if you're not using the international band bandwidth to, to access uh, far away content, it means that you're using, you know, less energy to access content, which is which is local. Uh, but I would also uh, stress on uh, the very um, um, a singular characteristic of com of community networks. Um, we talk about self de determination uh, and things like that. Um, uh, on the opportunity for for community networks to actually even host their own services. So we have seen. Um, uh, in uh, during the pandemic where people couldn't really uh, uh, have freedom of movement, uh, how important it, it was for them to have um, affordable, even free uh, and uh, unlimited access to, to technologies. And um, we have seen a um, uh, lot of uh, networks uh, installing local caches or local services for video conferencing. So uh, these are these are services that we should promote as much as possible on on, on community networks, um, and uh, obviously this would increase uh, uh, local use and uh, and therefore uh, having less dependency on on external services or paid services, um, and and uh, allowing people to um, to use services that are, are already local and close. And therefore, they would also benefit from um, uh, low latency services, higher higher quality, um, and, and and so on. Um, so, I would really like to to stress that sustainability is really um, is really broad. Uh, first of all, because sustainability can uh, can can also mean uh, uh, giving the power to the people to um, you know to 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 create their own type of network, the network that really resemble uh, the, the community itself and what they think is important. So having, having the ability to create uh, their own content and, and upload their own content at, at very low cost uh, and, and ho hopefully at uh, high bandwidth and high quality is, is really important. So this, is, this increases to some extent sustainability of uh, of, of the community in terms of strengthening the, the community itself. And of course, um, bringing content closer to the user and as I mentioned, uh, creates this uh, environmental sustainability uh, because it uses less uh, energy uh, elsewhere. So uh, yeah, these are my points that I wanted to bring uh, up today. Um, thank you.
Thank you, Amrish. That was a really great um, overview. Um, our next speaker is joining us from Spain. Um, Pedro Vilches has been involved um, in Grifinet, which is a, um, you can say, flagship community network in, in Catalonia. Um, it has been operating for almost 20 years and has over 37,000 active nodes. And apart from providing connectivity, uh, Grifinet is also promoting circular economy and reduction of e-waste. And Pedro is going to uh, tell us more about it in his presentation. Welcome, Pedro. Pedro, can you hear us? Hi. Yeah, now we can hear you now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, I want to raise two topics for this session. Uh, one is a proposal on reducing e-waste, and the other one is uh, remarking why community networks are a relevant actor in Europe. So, well, here is uh, my relevant volunteer activity. So 10 years, more than 10 years of experience in GitMinet through EXO, that is a nonprofit operator uh, from Barcelona with 100 mem members. But I'm also holding a position in a governing council of a telecom cooperative called Son Conexio which is also part of Giftinet and it's giving service to 9,000 members and 20,000 contracts. Uh, I also professionally working with, uh, when in the research group, this one, and I'm involved in tech projects with a strong involvement of small scale communities. Um, the proposal on reducing e-waste is very simple. So the root problem is that manufacturers are becoming responsible on how Wi-Fi routers are used. Uh, I put the notes at the end. Uh, this is called a, a, as EU radio directive from Free Software Foundation Europe. So the e-waste problem specifically is that Wi-Fi routers are generally designed for a very limited purpose and short time frame. They cannot be changed or modified and that eventually produce e-waste. And the proposed solution is uh, do the same as with computers. Make its users be responsible on what they do. Allow these devices to fit and enter the circular economy and be part of, for example, the area use ecosystem we have uh, here nearby Barcelona. Uh, why community networks are a relevant actor in Europe? Uh, first, let's present the problem. Problem maintaining uh, telecommunications infrastructure. So it started with the public sector and at some point they stopped maintaining it, maybe because it, it was a business and not a, just an expense, no? Uh, with the 90s liberalization, the, the private sector catches it, but it's struggling maintaining it. The recent discussion in Europe uh, about big telcos, they say too many operators is unsustainable and that the solution is the United States model, hence be less actors in the market. But for example, from the New York Mesh community network, they complain, but in New York City, far too many people don't have internet access. Uh, solution, invest on community networks. Uh, community networks really solve society needs. Uh, being a pool resource, common pool resource model means that public and private sectors can still participate at, as the other colleagues were saying, no? the, uh, the in, uh, financial institutions, uh, academia, government, uh, it's a non-excludable model. Uh, and a, even if the model fails, it could behave as an accelerator, delivering a more competitive private sector. And here we have a proven experience in Giffin, uh, an ISP data spin-off called Sombera, and from nothing, they got uh, 30 million euro on annual turnover in 2022. 
So, uh, but each community network is not only about delivering internet access, uh, they can also help uh, in mutual aid, international cooperation, sharing knowledge. Uh, here from the EXO perspective, I would recommend apc.org, battlemesh.org. Uh, we also have an xrcb.cat project that is a community radio. Uh, and uh, that also means bridging with the arts and with the neighbors and their concerns. Uh, community radio could be understood as a podcast platform. Uh, we also have a project called Plataforma, uh, and this could be understand, understood as a pilot that explores server-side resources usage by cooperatives from solidarity economy. Um, or other projects like uh, shoik.scoop, which is an open network for the Internet of Things on top of Giffinet. Um, given on the comments you did in the previous presentations, yeah, we are also serving real-time traffic, and that reduces international bandwidth for services such uh, with services such as Jitsi and Big Blue Button, uh, instead of using Zoom, which uh, makes also more sovereign on what we use. So here are the sources I use it, and thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Pedro, also for being so sharp in the uh, in the time management. Uh, I think there are a couple of uh, points that emerge uh, that we can mm, connect between pe what Pedro and Amrish were saying, which is re resonates a lot with what we have been doing over the past years in terms of uh, community networks on the one hand as uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships. So we really speak a lot about multi-stakeholder model during the IGF, but the multi-stakeholder model is not only about having different stakeholders discussing things, but it's also about having different stakeholder building things, implementing things, defining a governance model that allows them to operate even connectivity networks. Uh, but also then implementing them and creating uh, a, 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 a war digital ecosystem out of it. And that is the other point that uh, is something, again, that we have been stressing a lot over the past year that to me is the core or of what uh, some years ago I was calling network self-determination, which is at the, at really the basis of the, the digital sovereignty conception of the, co the, the community networks. The fact that you create not only connectivity, you create an entire ecosystem of content of services that are created by the community for the community. So the community understands the technology, develops the technology, and they regulate the technology. It's really the, the essence of digital sovereignty. Not, again, in, the in terms of authoritarian control, but in terms of empowerment and self-determination of the local community. Uh, we have been speaking and discussing and writing a lot about this with Carlos Vaca uh, since uh, several years. So Carlos from Chitsak, you have been doing amazing work, not only studying community networks, but also building them with your friends. So please, the floor is yours. So, hi everyone, thank you for having me and thank you for being here in the last day of the IGF. <laughs> so I know this is a big effort, so I'm very happy to share, to have the possibility to share with you. And I want to address one question, and is uh, how uh, we can relate or if there is a relation between capacity building and env environmental sustainability. Uh, and we, uh, we will depart or we share with you some of the lessons that we learned in the process of developing uh, the National Schools of Community Networks. So the National Schools of Community Networks are processes that have been in place uh, since three years ago. We started in the, in the beginning of the pandemic, we started this project uh, and it's part of the uh, LogNet initiative that is led by Rizomatica and uh, APC and is uh, with the support of FCDO from the Digital Access Program from the UK. And uh, these uh, national schools have been taking place in five countries, in Sudafrica, in Indonesia, Nigeria, Brazil, and Kenya. And in each of these countries, we work with uh, uh, big allies, uh, big organizations that uh, implement the, the process of these national schools. And each of them are very different. There are no single uh, 
curriculum that are very different within each other. Uh, and we they share a only one thing that it is the met methodological way in we develop these, these national schools. Uh, we depart from this uh, participatory action uh, research methodology, so we begin with the analysis of the context, we uh, conform in each of the, co in the countries an advisory committee made by specialists and also from people from the communities and organization, etc. And they uh, start to develop uh, the, this design and then implement, uh, implement the school. And uh, in, in each of the countries also we have seven micro-organizations, seven uh, community-based organizations who took part of the, of the training. And they uh, were involved since the beginning in the design but also in the implementation of the school, the workshops, no? they take the workshops, and then they have the opportunity to uh, develop uh, some small projects to benefit or to stretch the process in the communities. So uh, this is the last part, and in, if in this part is when we realized a lot of the, of the knowledge on how to build a community network and what are the needs that they, that they faced and how to, to address it. So uh, one of the problems, and and I'm sure uh, you all know that uh, we have this problem of e-waste, and uh, this is from Mexico, this is not from the countries of the, of the national schools, but it is uh, a rooftop of the uh, municipality presidency in one of, of the indigenous communities in Mexico, and only one of these antennas or this <laughs> infrastructure work, no? So, uh, you know, this is a very, very uh, big problem and it's related not only to uh, the political, uh, pol the, pub the public policy that is implemented, but also uh, the lack of cap capacities in the communities to maintain the equipment. So one of the first lessons we, we, we have in this process is that if we, through capacity building processes, we estrange or we develop no, this the critical vision about uh, the technologies, no, about the choosing of technologies, we have different ways to uh, to get results that, rel that are related with the uh, care of the environment and the territory. I'm sure Nils will talk more about it, but for example, uh, we develop uh, in Indonesia, they started to develop these bamboo towers, no? So are more sustainable and also that are beautiful, no? They are because they uh, made their own uh, houses with this architecture, and they took uh, the same uh, artisanal work to, to develop the towers. But also in the school, some of the organizations develop uh, or use arti artificial intelligence to develop projects. Two projects are beautiful. One of it is. Uh, you know, the fishermen to, uh, to try to know where are the, the fish bank and to travel less, no, and to go where the fish are, but also to, to know what, what banks have more fish and had less, and so they made a strategy, a sustainable strategy of this, uh, of this fishing. And the other one is the shrimp farms that are uh, led by the women in the communities and now they have these, uh, these tools in, in their cell phones who can uh, let, let them down the temperature, no? the, all the things that they need to know to maintain these uh, farms working. So they have the time to start another project and they are uh, joining and start different projects that are not related actually with the, the need to be all day taking care of the farms. So it, it is very interesting and it, 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 is, it is important. And in other countries, like in Brazil and Nigeria, they use a lot of uh, solar energy to, uh, for, the, for the network. So each the, uh, as I said, each of the schools was very different. Uh, the, other, the, other, the second point is that peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and the technical know-how also help with this, no? Because if the people, uh, know how to maintain the, the, the equipment, how to uh, look for common failures, and uh, no, they, they it implies less travel for the people who who lives in the city who need to go to, no, the technical people who go to 
to repair the, the things. There are also better handling of the equipment and less e e waste. And uh, this process was very, very evident in which uh, the National School of Community, of community Networks was led by a community network. No, not in all in all cases, the, the organization have a, had a community network. Now all, almost all had it. Uh, so uh, in Ke in Kenya and South Africa, they have this experience. So the technical knowledge was very very. Uh, I don't know, uh, but good, uh, good, good, good transmission to, to everyone. And the third one is the way in which in these training programs, in this process, uh, uh, the, the people uh, wave their learning community, you know, how to interact with each other, how to be a, an encounter point, so they start doing different projects. And one of the, of the things that we, uh, that we learn is the importance of the people to travel to other, to other places. For example, in South Africa, almost all the people who, who took the, uh, who participate in the, in the national school never get out from, the, from its community. So at when they uh, start uh, seeing other territories, see how other people uh, live, how, how, how the, the, the things are doing in other ways, they start to, to rethink in also their own territory and the ways they need to ca take care of it. And of course, uh, as uh, someone says in this, uh, in this uh, uh, session, the local content and the production is, is very important in this process too. So it is a part of this uh, territory and uh, care of the, of, the, of the things. And just uh, just to uh, finalize with inviting you to, to visit the CN Learning Repository. You will find a lot of materials soon. I think today you will find also this. And uh, so thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Carlos, and also for pointing the Community Network uh, Repository, which is an incredible source of material for anyone wishing willing to uh, learn more or to build even community networks. Speaking about building community networks, no one better than Niels can provide us a little bit more of insight on the challenges and opportunities of developing them. Thank you, Luca, and hi, everyone. My name is Niels Brock from Rhizomatica, and stepping in today uh, for our colleague uh, Shabani Belur uh, from uh, ISEA and APC due to connectivity issues. Uh, she cannot participate, unfortunately, so we see there's still need for to build a better and resilient uh, internet. So um, the uh, work that we uh, um, uh, yeah, proposed for this um, publication here uh, was titled Can Environmental Practices Foster Community Network Sustainability? So um, we would say yes, and uh, I would like to tell you a bit uh, what was uh, our approach to this, which is kind of a, a complementary methodology to uh, the work that Carlos Baca has just presented. So uh, community networks, as we learned over before, uh, uh, they have challenges um, in terms of uh, 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 getting, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, managing all the technologies that are involved um, and to to transmit a signal or to put up a, a local network. Uh, besides the the regulatory um, challenges that we heard so far, and uh, so there is a need for complementary internet solutions, as we uh, also heard earlier. So. Uh, how could a uh, community network do this and also in an efficient way and in a collaborative way? And um, the LogNet project, the uh, um, uh, local community network initiative that was already mentioned by Resomatica and APC, was working for several years uh, on innovation and technology, basically also through uh, peer contacts, but also on uh, with uh, subgranting. Uh, and uh, an effect and side effect, another so good one of, of subgranting, is that uh, each grantee uh, works uh, often very much on his or, or her own and uh, sometimes uh, there is a lack of collaboration but there are shared challenges uh, for uh, for the networks and we have tried to um, engage uh, with the community network ecosystem and uh, the community in a different way uh, putting up uh, a space that we call communities of practice so it's an approach where we uh, brought in not only community networks but also
also uh, other practitioners, uh, engineers, uh, experts on certain topics, also educators uh, that were able to uh, uh, explain and uh, build capacity uh, of some issues. And uh, so we worked along a concept of uh, emerging technologies, so to say, what does a community network needs to really uh, work, but also to be sustainable uh, for itself in economical terms, but also uh, for the planet. And uh, so I will just pick out two examples and uh, happy to um, yeah, uh, uh, dive a bit deeper in, in later discussions. So that was the question of, uh, of bamboo. And so if we talk about yeah, what does bamboo has to do with a, uh, with a, with a tech ne network, so where does this comes in? Uh, but there's always a need for, for infra infrastructure, so to say, to, to build up mass uh, structures. Uh, they need concrete, uh, they need steel, and it's not uh, resources that are locally available. So uh, bamboo is a plant uh, that is in many countries um, available as a, a resource that can be grown or that is already there. And so the question is how to treat it, uh, what, how to select this bamboo. And uh, so we were looking to build a, a community of, of practitioners there, uh, uh, by from India who had already done some, uh, some, some work on this. Uh, they provided the knowledge of how to plant bamboo. If someone really wants uh, 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 to put up a bamboo garden and in a couple of years uh, have its own uh, grown resources there. And uh, there were other examples like uh, the community around the science of towers. So uh, how can we uh, imagine towers that are also easy to replicate? And one nice example was uh, the tower that we saw in the image area from Indonesia, uh, then a community network from Uganda, Bosco. Uh, they said, we want this too. Uh, we want to try to replicate this. And then so online, uh, uh, they were uh, tutored and they put up the tower so it's possible. And this is kind of, uh, uh, uh yeah, uh, traveling solutions that were created and uh, we are still uh, exploring more about uh, how far can this go and uh, uh, where to take the bamboo approach. Um, solar energy is another uh, critical resource, so without uh, energy there is uh, no, no networking, no digital networking. And uh, again, here there was uh, a capacity uh, gap uh, uh, and a knowledge gap, uh, we would say, and uh, together uh, with uh, experts, but also persons as physicians that uh, are involved in community networks in Brazil, uh, setting up uh, online courses uh, to see, okay, how can we translate photovoltaic systems and the building blocks that are there on the market, uh, how can we make them available that uh, people can use them safely uh, so and that the equipment will be there for, uh, for a good while, how can they calculate uh, uh, what they need and uh, this was something um, yeah, ongoing. Also there are some uh, kind of new uh, technologies, some building blocks emerging like an open maximum uh, PowerPoint tracker, so making the energy use more efficient, this is uh, open uh, uh, hardware uh, and, uh, and open software, so uh, very much aligned also with the needs of communities. And uh, a last point maybe to uh, just to, uh, to put out, local services is something uh, that uh, really uh, um, yeah, stroke a chord also with the community networks to, uh, to work on this because uh, there are different uh, solutions when it comes to e-learning and uh, also content production and uh, uh, to have those, as it was explained before by Gifinet, uh, to have those available on, uh, on local servers uh, uh, is a great contribution because uh, then there's so really an ownership on the data, on the infrastructure. Of course, the, there's a capacity, uh, capacity building needed for this, but having those local servers, again, they, uh, they uh, make uh, those services, uh, if it's nicely done, more sustainable in terms to organize them for the community, but also um, the environmental impact um, can be reduced. So those are just some examples. And uh, yeah, um, thank you very much and looking forward for the discussion. All right, so we are we have uh, finished our speakers, and we now have a mi an open mic for everyone willing to provide comments, ask questions, or uh, share any kind of thoughts. So, if you want to um, discuss any, to raise any issue, or if you want to ask any questions, uh, I invite I would invite you to to use this mic in the middle. Uh, we don't have a roaming mic but there is, you can line there and ask your question. Please go ahead. Bom dia. Eu sou Gisele Martins, do Rio de Janeiro, favela da Maré, no Brasil. 
É muito importante ouvir essas experiências ao redor do mundo sobre redes comunitárias de acesso à internet. Mas uma pergunta, é, uma questão que eu queria perguntar é sobre... Eu moro numa favela que é dominada pela milícia, pelo tráfico, onde, na pandemia, a internet foi muito importante para a gente, mas hoje a gente não consegue mais ter acesso à internet, nem a linhas telefônicas, porque as operadoras, as antenas foram retiradas e hoje as redes de internet e de telefonia são dominadas pelo tráfico e pela milícia. E aí, a artigo... Maybe, maybe I suggest, uh, if, uh, if, uh, can I, I, if you and I can translate, but yes, but... Uh, Suzana Martins, she's from Rio de Janeiro, Mara Island. Uh, she was ta talking about how is militia and traffic dominated territory, how important was the internet in the pandemic times, but that right now they don't have access to telephone or internet uh, because the telecoms won't enter the territory because it is militia dominated. Continue. Continue. Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, Zonte. É, eu sou comunicadora comunitária e sou moradora desse território. A artigo 19, no Brasil, nos deu a alternativa de fazermos antenas alternativas para é, fazermos uma rede comunitária, mas, é, analisando os riscos, a gente avaliou que era melhor não fazer. E significa que nós, comunicadores comunitários, é, a gente não consegue fazer comunicação comunitária territorial e a própria favela, que tem 140 mil moradores, hoje não tem acesso à telefonia e nem à internet. É, e aí eu penso quais alternativas a gente teria de buscar soluções dentro de uma favela é, para que a gente tivesse acesso à telefonia e à internet numa favela que é tão importante e tão grande também no Rio de Janeiro. Ela está falando sobre como o Article 19 do Brasil oferece them to criar uma community network but they uh, assess the risks and they figure it, they shouldn't do it because it was a life-threatening risk because of the militia and the traffic. And so now she's asking what could be done, how could we think about this kind of specific problem in this context? Acho que é isso. Por isso, não é? Quem fez para ti? Obrigada. Let's take the other question that we have here and then we can start having a round of answers in the limit of the possible from this uh, group. Hello, my name is José Artur. I'm part of the youth delegation from Brazil, and I'm a research on community network in indigenous communities in the Amazon region. You would like to do a small comment on this subject. And uh, when we're talking about community networks, is it, it, it is necessary not only to talk about the implementation part in other issues but also about what, what actions are being taken to ensure that digital inclusion is actually applied to avoid the digital illiteracy. And how to teach the community about what opportunities they can have through the, connect, the connective obtained through these community networks, that is. How they can use it to change their realities. And this is a point that I think is always always very important to talk about when the subject is being discussed because it helps ensure the community sovereign. I think we, we, we yeah, if, if you want, if we can have, have another one and then we, we, we we'll um. Yeah, one question you already know, but um, two things. One is um, I've been talking to people who have certain ideas of digital sovereignty. One of my friends who's a researcher who wants to work with us in some European countries said like, but you know, we have to be digitally sovereign so we can't cooperate very closely. Does it make ring a bell for you? So, did you understand? Okay, so when you collaborate with somebody on technology, there is this flag going on like we have to be digitally sovereign, so therefore we cannot collaborate very closely. Okay, so this is one idea of digital sovereignty. I, wa I wanted to bring this to focus because I was very confused. Okay, second one is there's a lot of communities, great work, 
amazing sessions, but I don't know a representation of who they are. You cannot have community as rolled in and people talking about, we did Zoom, we connected a uh, YouTube, right? We can always, who are they? What are they doing with the community networks, right? We want to understand how they are participants, they are a community in the network for the services, okay? And uh, I can go on about that, but again, Luca, web. You can bring all the internet that you want, but without the web in the community, you're just bringing, connecting Zoom, YouTube, something else, and still talking about digital sovereignty. We have to think about this. Okay. Okay, I think we, w we have, a we might have several reactions here. Who wants to go first? So thank you, thank you, because this this question are, es are I think essential. No, uh, we can't uh, talk about all the things <laughs> that we learn and we um, we know. No, and because there are very long processes. And uh, used to say that actually uh, that's why capacity building, I think, is key in this process. No, because if we think uh, digital sovereignty or digital autonomy or technological autonomy as a black or white thing, we are in the bad way, I think. Uh, and also if we think that it is like a place <laughs> in which we will stay and we will have all the autonomy in our lives and we will be very happy because all of, of all us have autonomy, it's also a, a, a bad way, I think, to, to understand it. But if we understand this like a process in which the communities and us actually have the enough information to take good decisions, that decisions that we think are better for us, we are in the in the good way. So we th we want to think at least in uh, in Latin America, the uh, technological autonomy as a, a process of taking decisions uh, by by us, but with all the information that we need to know. So if w if we community understand that and they uh, still need to use Zoom because it's better the signal, like, I don't know, whatever they want, but, uh, but they understand what they are doing, no, or, or Facebook or, or whatever, no? Uh, but they understand what they are doing, no? And the risk they have, it, it, is, it is better because if, if not, you have this, no? It's connected or, or disconnected and I think this is not, not the way. In one of the conferences yesterday, someone says that uh, we need to, to escape from, from the, the idea that it is uh, the better stage of, of, the, of the connectivity or no connectivity. And there is a lot of, of gray scale, I think, in it. And the important thing is that the communities have the, cap the, the, the understanding of what is happening, no? And what it implies to use one of, 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 of of different technologies, and then how we can, uh, how they can have the environment to develop the projects they want to develop, no? So this, is, I think this is key. And the other thing about the violence is, is very difficult, no? Uh, on the one hand, we have in Africa, in Sudafrica and Kenya, we have uh, community networks that are in urban areas, no? Very good uh, community networks like Tandanet, like Binet, uh, like, uh, no? Ocean View in, 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 in Cape Town. Uh, and uh, also in, on the other hand, in our experience in Mexico, you know, we have the narcos. I, I know that you all have seen series of narcos. <laughs> and they are, uh, most of it is really, no, this is this a reality in Mexico. And we work in the north of Mexico, and we, we, we need to negotiate a lot with them. Actually, they have be the better communication I saw <laughs> in, in the rural areas. But we need, we need, they are part of, 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 the, of the environment and it is very difficult. This, it doesn't mean that we need to stay in the same table with them, but we know that they are uh, behind all the discussion in the communities and we need to, to know that. And it's very difficult, it's very difficult. They, 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 they have like, like a big, a big truck with, with a lot of internet, uh, satellite internet and, and 
satellite uh, phones. So they have a lot of technology. No, no, no. The, the, this is not community networks. This is the Narcos network. Yes. How was the negotiation? Just I've got curious. How would you approach them? About uh, I don't know. For example, in one know. of the meetings we had, no? okay, there is two two men that are like you know, you know, and then they are very quiet. Okay. And they go out. And some people say that, ah, they are looking, what are you mean, no? Okay. Why? Because they want also internet for, for their homes, or no? Because okay. the, this other what communication is not it? for the daily life, it's, it's for, okay. for community. That's their interest, yes. That's their personal interest. Yes, they, okay. they have, they want to, to their children be get connected, okay. they, no, the school too. So they actually, in some places, they help <laughs> with developing <laughs> infrastructure. It's, it's very complex, okay. no, thing. Yes. And so we know that in the communities, despite uh, we don't need to, to stay with them and, and to talk with them, but they are part of the conversation okay. of the decision making. No? Just a starting point of the negotiation yes. is their personal interest. Yes, to know, to know that they are th they're there and this, okay. this is a reality, no? Thank you. <laughs> and uh, that's very good. And let me just, a smaller Portuguese uh, version, Gisela, é um prazer conhecer, bem-vinda, <laughs> e obrigada pela pergunta, depois eu, eu falo em português contigo, uh, just saying uh, I'm going to talk to her in Portuguese later, but anyway, um, thank you very much for the questions, I, I, I can address uh, every single point, but I think uh, there is a common line here, uh, which is also uh, to, to bring that concept of meaningful access, we tackle this a lot, and the policy uh, network on meaningful access, so it's not only about you know, bringing the, the connection, but it's about the whole environment that is connected, uh, that someone is connected to, and uh, and the skills that are involved in it, the, the, the equipment, but also, um, let's say, the, the local political environment. And I think what um, first Gisela and, and José Artur brought both in the sense of, well, one into the uh, a herb, a herb, sorry, uh, urban environment, that's a very non-rural environment. <laughs> Let's change the wording if that's difficult. Uh, in a non-rural environment, uh, that, that um, well, first, it's a myth that only right remote and, 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 and rural areas have problems. So uh, it's important to bring that, that we have this, those islands even in the cities. And then uh, that also raises uh, on the indigenous community part and the Islam's part, uh, how important it is to have this uh, local voice heard because uh, there are different challenges and, and, and it's okay. But first, you need to have uh, a space where y you can openly uh, share that and uh, uh, at least look for someone that is uh, having the same problem or has addressed this problem and, and, and try to, to uh, to get some uh, inputs on, on, on how y you can uh, bring to solutions. Uh, but also, it is important if, if you think about how to scale that, because if there are many uh, that are facing the same problem, how we are going to find a long-standing solution and a more sustainable um, uh, solution in, in the future. So uh, that's my, my first point. Uh, Connecting, you know, all these uh, dots and, and and all these experiences and and having the places where this can be done, I, I, it's I, 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 it's the first step. And then um, I'm not going into the trade-offs <laughs> and uh, the digital sovereignty <laughs> concept uh, in full, but I think it's 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 a good alert that Carlos said in terms of. Um, I think the major concern is the trade-offs you have in this kind of uh, collaborative arrangements uh, and, and, and the, the real awareness of what you are giving up when you buy into the solution. So there is no right or wrong. Um, it's just a matter of how uh, well this is understood and, uh, and how this is advertised in terms of, uh, you know, being community network driven uh, or not. So um, I would put uh, in, in that sense. I just wanted to add a point that uh, we also have to understand that uh, what we are speaking about and which are the problems that we want to face and what are the solutions to th those problems. So the community networks are not a silver bullet to solve all the problems that we have in the world. So the fact that there is 
and, and I'm, 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 let me speak, <laughs> the, the fact that there is criminality in a given area is not something that uh, sadly can be solved with uh, community networks. It is not the task of the community networks to deal with warlords or, or, or drug lords. Uh, so it's uh, the community network can help. Uh, actually, they are a, a very good complementary so solution to solve the problem because they bring culture to people, they bring communi communication to people. Uh, there is, I mean, you as a uh, Brazilian communicator, I'm sure you are very well, uh, you know very well Paulo Freire, and he used to say that education doesn't change the world. Education changes the people, then then change the world. And I think you have to have this similar approach to connectivity. Connectivity does not change the world. Connectivity can change the people, and then the people will change the world. So if you if you think that the the silver bullet, it, the, commu the, the community network is the silver bullet that solves all, all the problems, I'm I'm, I'm sorry, but <laughs> you will be disappointed. But it is a very good. It's something. It is an alternative solution to bridge the gap that are evident in the classic traditional connectivity solutions that are state and markets. Because if all the, the all the be them rural or 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 uh, uh, areas that are not connected or peripheral area or, or slam in cities that are not connected they are so called market failure it's um, technically they are called market failure areas because the market fails to connect them because there is no interest economic interest in connecting them and so you don't have return on investment S some of them may also be state failure areas because the state for various reasons has abandoned those areas and but we all know that no, no area is without no community is without rules so when the state is not ruling someone else is ruling and that is the problem that i think the state should solve not really the community networks but uh, the community networks are a good complementary solution to expand connectivity uh osama you wanted to say something so uh, actually this is not a question but a point of observation and also the experience uh, and most of the many of the players are sitting there and some players are sitting here uh, uh, the observation is community network is is so far practiced as an alternative way of providing or building connectivity which may be frugal which may be commune oriented and so on and so forth uh, and the second point is that as soon as GSM comes or the internet itself reach you in terms of access community network gets challenged and they either close down or they go haywire or all the users get onto that network, uh, right? Not that the previous network was not connected to the internet, but in terms of viability of existence. Uh, the third is that the best community network practice may have become an ISP in the local area like GUIFI and maybe Rizomatica uh, and, and there may be some examples that I may not know. The discussion that I want to uh, do is that what is the future of community network in itself? And coming forward, because uh, first 15 years internet was look up to, now we are fear of internet. We are fearful of internet. Because there are more bads coming to you or you have to go through those bads to get the good out of it. And therefore, can community network become an alternative commune in itself, in other words, intranet? You know, can it become an intranet and I connect to the internet only when we want? Or something like that, right? Is there some practice like that or is there something, I mean, since you document a lot, I mean, this is something very important that we need to discuss is that can community networks not in technological term, not as an alternative of ISP, not an alternative for access, but to create your own commune, like your own gated community, uh, that's the wrong word. Uh, whatever, I mean, you can safeguard yourself, you can run on your own, even though you have Airtel or you have NTD Docomo or whatever, I don't want it, you know. I, I just plug in and then plug off, uh, you know, if, if somebody wants because of this. And, and, uh, and this is something that we need to discuss because now only uh, one third of the uh, world is yet to be connected. So are we looking at community network as an alternative to connect those, th those who are uh, one third of the world or safeguard the those who are already connected is, is the question, yeah.
Yeah, thanks for the question, Osama. So maybe I can start. I think uh, uh, you are uh, pointing out in a in a good direction. So uh, I think it's beyond connectivity and it's beyond access. So when we talk about the future of uh, community networks and uh, 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 so the, the inter intranet approach to have like local services, this is uh, uh, really something or where there can be a difference and. Uh, to start at the other end, so what does meaningful connectivity mean at the community level? And also during the, the IGF, we have seen like different uh, categories and things, but what is missing is also the question, how would the community respond to this question? What brings meaning uh, to the connectivity from their end? And it can be very, very different if we look at a rural or a urban community and then uh, to uh, another one, there's so many different factors. And uh, so only uh, if we uh, take into account this, I think then, uh, it's possible to uh, to rethink and uh, from uh, recent work that we have done there is a, a study that we are working on also on, on local services and understanding um, what are the importance what are services of importance for communities and again that can be different it can be agricultural services can be educational ones content creation uh, but uh, there are things there and that can be often done uh, uh, in a different way in a complementary way we could say in an alternative way uh, whatever is the framing, but uh, I think uh, this is important because you're right. If then, uh, if it's only about connectivity and uh, there is a, a provider who has a, a business model that, that, that comes uh, at a community at, at some point, uh, uh, so this collective effort could be could be undone. Yeah. I can take it very quickly, uh, just to to react to that first. If we are going to put this question of the community networks becoming an internet service provider or not, we are in a good place. That's a good problem. I mean, it means that the community networks has grown and evolved to the place that the, it is perhaps <laughs> an ISP. But anyway, uh, I'm not going to the nitty gritty of uh, you know it should be one or not, but. Uh, because I think there are some other uh, regulatory um, discussions that needs to, uh, to th that might change in some places where uh, we are looking for more of this social license for uh, for um, community networks and uh, as an alternative uh, provider and known um, uh, and, and and do not confuse with the traditional internet service provider. But anyway, um, and and as you can see, while I'm a lawyer, nobody's perfect. <laughs> And so I take more for the, you know, regulatory and and, and process environment. Um, I, I I would just uh, put a cautions on the examples that you were mentioning, like oh, and then it becomes the internet service provider, and perhaps it's also the content providers, and you know, this consolidation of all the 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 the. Um, the, the the services and 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 uh, connectivity uh, in in the community networks uh, because then you might be becoming uh, I mean there is no again right or wrong if this is uh, really the community will and uh, it's community driven uh, the problem is when this is uh, package has community and 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 or something for the community but it's really a top down and something that is not. Um, you know, um, um, their will, and it's not their self-determination. So that's uh, just the risk for uh, for this consolidation uh, that that you've been um, outlining. Thank you. Yeah, just want to add uh, an, element, an element to this with regard to the digital sovereignty debate, which is uh, actually is actually a twofold uh, dimension. Be be on the one hand, if as Raquel was was mentioning, if the community network is so successful that it becomes a very well-performing ISP with very low prices. Well, that is, I think, it, 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 the, the community network has succeed because it became exactly, uh, starting from scratch, it became exactly like the big telcos, but without being a, bit a big telco, with, with, with while being community-driven. So that is an enormous uh, success of the local community. Uh, as long as it, it is maintained by the local community and the governance model is, is self-driven by the local community. On the other hand, if there are some, co we have also documented over the past years, there are community networks where they are, they, they are as uh, Osama was mentioning, basically intranet and local communities, and that is another element of their sovereignty. If their choice is to create a local network to share information, to even have their own platforms to communicate or to trade services or to have information on medical treatments and they only connect sometimes to the internet to 
do whatever they want. Again, that is the reason why we may argue it's an expression of digital sovereignty, because it is local communities, people willingly understanding what technology means, building it and using it for what they want. And if they choose not to communicate with you, I'm sorry for you, <laughs> but it's their choice. And uh, so, Carlos, do you have a question also, a comment? No, okay. So it's the, 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 the so I think I'm keeping on, last, last five minutes. So you have a question or a comment? Okay, I saw. <laughs> 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 no, so to, to conclude is simply, I, would want to, I, I wanted to, to stress that we really have to consider uh, the self-determination element of it, which is being, the master of your own digital destiny, being the one that, the, the, the one that understands what you are dealing with and crafts a plan to, what you to, to, to succeed in your aspiration. And if then is your aspiration is becoming, having a local ISP that works like Telefonica in terms of quality, but has half the prices and you redistribute the benefits in the local economic environment, well, I would say that you have been very successful. Then we can disagree. But I think that is not a, 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 a failure. On the contrary, it could be seen as a success. Please, Carlos. Thank you, Luca. Uh, Carlos Ray Moreno, Association for Progressive Communications. First of all, thank you very much, Senka. Thank you very much, Luca. I mean, we are talking about the WISIS plus 20 review, the IGF. What is the impact of the IGF? And certainly the IONEC Coalition on Community Connectivity, I think, has shown over the years, over the outputs, over the discussions how much value there is on holding this, this type of conversations. Second, I want to, to speak on behalf, and not them, for of, of course, of Okoro, who was supposed to be speaking for connectivity reasons. He's not with us. Uh, he is uh, an APC member from Nigeria, the Media Awareness and Justice Initiative, where actually is touching on some of the elements that Osama was talking about, right? So they are working, collaborating with, uh, with another APC member, the Open Culture Foundation, with the SUD project on doing uh, bringing meaning to, to their community around uh, a spill of, uh, of oil uh, in, the, in the Port Harcourt area where their communities are based, as well as uh, monitoring air pollution with devices and bringing you know, value-added services to the internet that they had, right? The thing is that by doing that project, uh, they also realized that the connectivity that they were having from the mobile operators was not enough. So they went and uh, set up uh, in the last year, actually. It wasn't, you know, one of the uh, pioneers on, on this movement. They started less than 10 months ago, uh, starting a community network, two community networks actually in the areas where they work. So this type of uh, citizen science can be done in, you know, and have the internet quality uh, that it requires to do, to do what they require because also the affordability issues that they face in, in Nigeria, right? So it started the other way around. It started from bringing meaning and value-added services and using the, 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 the digital platforms and, and solutions for solving the issues that they were having and touching upon what the, the, the problems that they are facing around, you know, air quality and, and pollution of oil. Um, you know, it, it, it was, you know, their challenge. Their, and using those type of tools to actually uh, uh, br bring the community together and, and solve as well their connectivity issues. Anyway, I, I really hope Okoro was here and I could uh, speak uh, on behalf of the project that they are doing that is really, really nice. Thank you. Okay, so we have also the announcement that there will be a nice, a very, an excellent talk this afternoon. I'm sorry I will have to fly right after this, uh, this lunch, but I, I, I'm sure that I will, will watch it on, str on streaming. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much to everyone for your excellent uh, food for thought. I think all the participants here uh, have mo many more ideas now to reflect on, on community networks and digital sovereignty and environmental sustainability. And if you want to have even more ideas, do not forget to have your complimentary copies of the report of this year that are here for free. So if you want, please have as many as you, as you want. Thank you very much. <laughs>